Broadcasting from Silicon Valley, California, this is Conversations with Jenny Lynn. You're watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn, and tonight I have another fascinating guest to share with you, Nova Spivak, and he's one of America's best serial entrepreneurs. And I am so grateful for this opportunity to have this segment with Nova because he has so much exciting developments, developing projects and developed projects that he's worked on that we would have to do a series of interviews to cover them all. So tonight, Nova, thank you for taking the time to spend with me on this show. Thanks, Jenny Lynn. I know that you've done many, many things, but tonight I wanted to focus on the project you're working on now and tell us how it's related to COVID-19. So um, I'm working on a, a, a company called VLX Corporation that runs a service called Valence Medical. And what Valence does uh, is try to solve the shortage of PPE, um, these emergency medical supplies, for government and institutional uh, buyers who need large quantities of this stuff, um, large quantities, but they don't have um, a way to get it uh, directly. Their, their traditional supply chains are completely out of stock. Uh, and now they're striking out on their own, trying to source manufacturing and they have no experience with that. So we put together a team of experts in manufacturing and supply chain and finance in uh, working in China in sourcing and qualifying factories, uh, as well as in technology to create a commodities exchange where the buyers and sellers of these uh, emergency medical supplies can connect directly um, and, and actually uh, transact without middlemen. And, and by doing this, we can reduce price gouging and some of the other issues in the market, which are due actually to too many middlemen um, adding to the price in between the actual manufacturer and the purchaser. That's wonderful. So when did you start this and where did the idea to do it come from? Well, it goes back to late December of 2019 when um, I was doing a lot of business development in China related to some ventures I was working on. And at that time, I, after many years of, of uh, being in China, I developed many friendships and some of my friends started telling me in China that there was a pneumonia outbreak in Wuhan. Uh, and I started seeing a little tiny bit about that in the, in the news media as well. And so uh, I noticed that and tracked it and I, and I saw that it was increasing, began to research it. And um, from previous work that I've done uh, tracking diseases in another analytics company I built, uh, I, I recognized the early signs of a, a, a potential pandemic. That's amazing. So did you warn anyone about this? Well, actually I did. I warned all of my friends, my colleagues, my family. I told everybody that I knew that I thought that there was a new SARS epidemic starting in China um, or that it was some variant on that um, and that we should prepare in case it got out of control. But nobody would believe me. Everybody thought I was crazy. That is unbelievable. Well, you know, you hear so many things and people think it's propaganda. People think it's, I mean, it's very difficult when someone comes and tells you something like this to believe. How soon after you warned people and it started in China that people start taking it seriously? Well, it, it was many months. And, and so in order to um, start to share the evidence that I was finding that convinced me uh, I created a website called GermInfo, GermInfo.org. And GermInfo was a place to aggregate and share news, research, even social media um, that added to the hypothesis, or actually, I guess you could say the warning uh, that added credence to that uh, for others who weren't watching it all the time like I was. And some other collaborators joined me and we started building a curated news site, uh, which was the first portal about coronavirus in the world. You were lucky that you weren't exposed to it because right about that time is when it really started spreading. Well, of course, being completely on top of the pulse of all the news and research, I was more paranoid and careful uh, than most people. Uh, so as well as building 
Germ Info, um, I began to um, take my own advice and prepare for my family and, and, uh, and, and tell all my friends as well what they should buy, what they needed to stock up on in advance, many months before everybody else. Um, and so um, we actually then had formed a Facebook group that's very uh, popular and very active at GermInfo.org, the GermInfo Facebook group, um, with about 7,000 people um, helping to find news, um, medical information, and sharing other uh, information about their stories. Uh, and this community around GermInfo really started to grow. Uh, and of course, uh, we also were teaching people how to repair, um, how to get ready to self-isolate, uh, what PPE they might need, what food and medicine and other things they should stock up on before uh, the rush of people. Because we didn't want ourselves or anybody that we were trying to help to have to be in that crowded supermarket um, at the time when people really were infectious. We wanted them to get what they needed ahead of time. Did you warn them and to get toilet paper? Of course, and everything else. Um, I guess in Australia, they, they must have taken me too seriously. But everywhere else, uh, you know, we have friends all over the world, and I still get um, letters and messages from people saying, thank you, I heard about this from you first, and it's because of you that, you know, me and my family were able to get these supplies before they ran out. Why do you think people didn't take you seriously when you first warned about it? Well, there's, you know, there's something called normalcy bias, um, which is a kind of cognitive bias where uh, people tend to try to ignore evidence um, that things aren't normal. People want things to be normal. And in fact, in life, once in a while, rarely, but it's it not impossible, um, you know, these black swan events do occur. And, and this is one such event. Nobody anticipated it or let's say Bill Gates and others had been warning about it for years, but nobody thought it would really happen to them right away. And then boom, out of nowhere, this happens. And normalcy bias uh, tends to be that little voice in your head that says, no, no, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna be perfect. It's miraculously gonna go away. It's not really even happening. It's a hoax, right? That's normalcy bias. Uh, uh, normalcy, uh, that is normalcy bias. So normalcy bias, let me say again. Normalcy bias is that little voice in your head that, that doesn't want to believe the facts uh, even when you know, they're obvious because they contradict what you think is normal. And so um, even though there was massive evidence, um, they were shutting down entire provinces, you know, 50 million people under lockdown in China, people here just didn't want to take that seriously. Right. And so even all the way up to the White House, you had um, sort of coronavirus denial taking place for, for several months. Uh, we had intelligence at the top levels of our government here that um, this outbreak was occurring. And e even while that intelligence was coming through, you know, our official, um, you know, from the White House and other sources, our official view was, no, it's nothing, it's not serious. So because of that, the people I was trying to warn, a, warn about this had a lot of doubt. They, they didn't know whether to believe the authority figures who were saying, no, don't worry, it's a hoax, uh, or to believe you know, people like me from left field uh, you know, were showing them these facts. Well, there's so many people that both you and I know, and both um, a lot of people that we probably don't know, but they really buy into these conspiracy theories. And so, I mean, what, what do you think of some of the conspiracies that are flying around? I'm sure you've heard some of them. Today, I yeah. heard that Bill Gates has a new drug coming out, and this is why they created this virus. I mean, you heard well, the craziest I mean, things. I don't think Bill Gates would do that, um, but uh, I, think, I think he's been warning that, that, that um, there would be a pandemic sooner or later. And you know, he's probably more prepared than others um, to, to help fight it because he's been studying it and working on it for such a long time. I mean, he's, he's what known about he working on what he was, was he's been, he's been spearheading, spearheading a number of initiatives in, in global health, uh, he and his wife. And so, you know, that they're, they're essentially a think tank that's always studying these kinds of issues and how to solve them or prevent them from happening. So we shouldn't mistake the fact that they're prepared for some kind of conspiracy. They're just more prepared. They, they've been warning us about this. Now, as far as conspiracy theories go, um, there are all kinds of different 
um, theories wildly spreading around. Um, the biggest one is that COVID-19 was created in the lab. Now, actually, we don't know really what the origin is. We don't know if it was natural. We don't know when or where it started. There are a number of different hypotheses about this. Um, it's also possible that it started in a lab, but nobody's proved that and nobody's disproved it. So at this point, that's just wild speculation. Actually, most scientists who've looked at the evidence think that it's pretty unlikely that this was a lab accident. It's more likely from, from the analysis of the genome that it did come from a natural source. But that said, it's a black swan event and we really don't know. And we might never really know because the data itself is not complete. It, it emerged and took everyone by surprise. And I think it'll be quite some time before we really understand uh, how this happened. And I think by the time we know enough about how it happens to inoculate against it, it would already have mutated into another strain. So how do you feel about that? I think that's very possible because a lot of these viruses do that. Coronaviruses in particular um, seem to have a, a really uh, high mutation rate. And mm -hmm. um, this strain uh, actually has already mutated into at least three or more uh, different strains, uh, and which may account for the different mortality rates that, that we've seen in different parts of the world. Um, Iran seems to have had a very serious outbreak and may have a, a more um, aggressive strain than, than what hit Europe and the US. Um, we, we don't know yet. Uh, Wuhan seems to have been a, an, a fairly aggressive strain. But uh, at this point, if you, if you look to um, the 1918 pandemic, the Spanish flu, yeah. Uh, one thing we know is that in that uh, pandemic, there were multiple waves. It went around the world three times. Um, and it was, I believe, the second wave that was the most um, fatal. And so we don't know yet what's going to happen. It, I don't think from everything I've seen that this is going to end quickly. Well, I, I don't know if we need to be concerned so much about the end as we should be concerned about how to protect ourselves from it. And so my concern is, and I don't know if you know much about this, I feel that it's difficult to really tell how hard some countries are being hit for several reasons. One is that we're not testing, they're not able to test everyone in the country. But the second thing is, I feel like some countries are deliberately not exposing the true number of fatalities. And I don't want to name any country because I don't know, and it would just be my assumption. But I have a difficult time believing that China only had 3,000 deaths. And if they had, if that is true, I was told by someone I interviewed that everyone in the country of China was given the BCG shot. And I grew up in a country where we were all given the BCG shot. And what I've been doing is my own research. I'm not a scientist, but I have noticed that the countries where I know the people were given BCG shots, their fatality rates are not as high. And even though they've had you know, quite a few contaminations, they have not resulted in deaths. What do you think of that? Well, I really don't know. Um, I haven't seen the data on that. Um... So uh, who knows, it's possible. Um, I really don't know. And I, I would say, you know, let's wait and see what the experts think about that idea. Um, you know, certainly um, for protecting yourself from, from the virus, uh, I don't think that we're gonna see a vaccine anytime soon. Um, first of all, because the virus is mutating quickly. Um, and, and secondly, because it's just very hard to make a vaccine like this. Um, you know, no vaccine has been made for SARS, even though SARS has been around for quite a while. Um, so, do you uh, think that's because it's same as the corona? It's just mutating so quickly. Apparently, it's difficult to make vaccines uh, for coronaviruses, and so that's certainly true. Um, in addition, even at a at a rapid pace, it, it would take 
nine to 12 months to come up with a candidate and then you have to test it. You have to do animal studies. You have to do, you know, multiple phases of clinical trials, you know, getting a drug to market safely. Um, you, you really shouldn't cut corners. Um, and even if it's fast tracked, I don't think it would be less than a year. And then once approved, even at that point, um, there'd be risk. And furthermore, you have a challenge of scaling up production to make enough to actually distribute it to everyone who needs it. And so realistically, even if best case, they found a, a created a vaccine, let's say within a year, um, it would still be another year or so before they could make enough of it uh, that everybody would get inoculated. So I think we're looking at several years of difficulty unless it just miraculously goes away. My concern based on what I'm learning from the various interviews I've done around the world is that people are so concerned with the state of their economy that they are allowing people back out too soon and they're cutting their quarantine short. And I spoke with someone yesterday in England who told me that the way their quarantine is working is they're locked down and then they're allowed back out and then they're locked down again. So they're doing it in cycles to sort of just kind of get to regenerate the economy a little bit. But I'm looking at that and thinking, is that safe? Yeah. And what do you think about that idea? Because apparently we are going to start doing that here in the US as well. Right. So. Um, there's some evidence that flattening the curve um, really doesn't work um, in the long term. And so, for example, um, there are some uh, places where they thought it was under control and now it sort of seems to be coming back um, in Asia. So if that's the case, then it might be potentially more sustainable to have kind of rolling lockdowns in different places. But there's also a risk, there was an MIT study um, I just read today where they used an artificial intelligence approach to um, try to forecast the, the disease. And, and that system has been completely accurate in forecasting what's happened around the world. That model says that if we stop social isolation too soon, um, it'll actually have explosive consequences um, that will completely undo all of the progress we've made and that it'll actually end up being worse. So Isn't that what's happening in China now? Yeah, they're starting to start starting to see some resurgence. There have been reports uh, of outbreaks in a number of mm -hmm. cities, and that you know that could potentially be serious. Um, similarly, um, if we uh, stop social isolating too soon and go back to work too soon, um, it actually may end up being much worse for the economy. That's my fear. Better medicine, you know, yeah, say, that's my fear. Yeah. Well, how do you know what the right thing to do? Well, I think the right thing to do is to try to stay locked down for a few more months, at least. Um, if, if the U.S. could actually do that, and I realize that's asking a lot, um, but if, if we could do that, um, or very, very strictly only allow certain critical sectors to return to work, uh, I think we would be able to halt the spread maybe by fall. But... You know, if we are too hasty in going back to work or going back to public places, um, I think the result will, will be that um, we'll have a, an explosive resurgence uh, instead in the, in the fall timeframe, which will go right through um, next winter. And actually, it's expected that this will be seasonal anyway. The question is, how bad will it be? Well, what do you think? I think it'll be bad. Um, but I think that uh, if we stop social isolation too soon, it will be extremely bad. So it's not a question of, can we prevent this? It's a lesser of two evils question. And we need to, unfortunately, choose the lesser of two evils. I agree with you. And so we're fortunate in the sense that this is affecting us right before the summer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good time. It's a good time to isolate. At the same time, um, you know, it's hoped that the higher temperatures will pre make the aerosols less airborne and that the, the heat will perhaps damage the virus on surfaces. We don't really know if that's true. Um, there have been hypotheses that somehow heat 
or drier air, warmer air will somehow, or, or UV radiation will somehow um, destroy the virus uh, outdoors. We don't know if that's really true. Um, we haven't seen you know, the rates of infection in hot countries be dramatically less. Um, and it's only just starting to hit places like India. Um, we have hardly any information about what's happening in Africa, but it's got to be there. So uh, I think we haven't really seen enough data yet to, to know what will happen. So um, you're a serial entrepreneur. Apart from your, the company that you've just launched, do you have any other ideas of anything new you can launch to help with this? Well, really, I mean, all of my thinking has been around um, VLX Corporation and um, trying to come up with a solution to the supply chain logjam, uh, which is a sustainable solution. So, you know, there are some nonprofit projects to try to get masks. Those are one shot projects. They get some masks and then they're done. But how do we, how do we create a, a real solution to the, the underlying problems that led to um, this shortage and, and that might cause future shortages? And so when we, when we look at the problem, um, there are a couple dimensions, one of which is just that um, the and customers in large governments and institutions enterprises, you know, municipalities, they usually buy their critical supplies through distributors, big distributors, um, who usually never run out of stock. They have stuff in warehouses. Uh, and it's the old fashioned way of buying medical products. Unfortunately, when a sudden event like this happens, that approach quickly runs out of, of supply. And, and so then what you have is a situation where these end customers have to get these critical supplies. They can't get them through ordinary channels. Right. And so they strike out on their own, trying to find manufacturers themselves. And they have no experience with that. So they fall right into the hands of unscrupulous speculators, fake suppliers, all kinds of different scams. And that's what we've seen um, in the last few months is many states um, made these impulse buys and ended up losing their money or not getting what they thought or getting expired goods or um, simply running into all kinds of obstacles. They didn't have any experience with working in China with manufacturers. So um, in trying to help many of these states and institutions that had come to me through GermInfo asking me if I could help them, uh, because I was at that time one of the few sources of information, uh, we realized their problem really is they need assistance in this process. And more importantly, there were too many middlemen speculating and trading in between them and the actual supplier. So to solve that, we decided to try and create a commodities exchange, the valence exchange, uh, through the service valence medical that we began um, to bring together supply and demand for these critical supplies and enable them to discover one another um, and transact more safely. Uh, and when I say more safely, it's because we do a lot of diligence um, to make sure that the supply is real and that they have all the certificates they should have, the different FDA, CE, NIOSH certificates they need. And if the factories are also um, properly audited and you know, they don't have bad labor practices, they're clean, um, their results are good. On the other side, we brought together these real institutional or large government uh, buyers or good customers, um, but they have a problem in that they, they cannot pay up front to have things manufactured, which is what the factories are, are demanding. And because of this gap between how they, the, the buyers need to procure these products and how the manufacturers need to sell them right now, they're not able to transact. So to solve that, we need to step in, um, not only provide an exchange, but also provide a financing mechanism to enable um, someone, in this case us or partners, to finance these purchase orders, get the stuff manufactured, and then give it to the states and institutions and allow them to pay net seven or net 15 or net 30, which is how they traditionally would want to pay for these. So if we can solve that, which is really a, a technology and a finance solution coupled together, then we can actually allow all of this demand, which is stuck to transact and get the supply. And, and so the irony is there actually is a supply. There actually are PPE. Um, there are factories. 
we, we aren't getting them into this country because we haven't solved the problem of how to enable these organizations to actually purchase it. So with the, the pandemic, how are your suppliers going to, because if they're also, where's most of your, um, so where are most of your supplies coming from? Well, because most of the world's, from, most of the world's medical supplies and PPE are made in Asia and a, and a large portion of that is made in China. Right. So, which is um, where I'm coming from with that question, because when they're on lockdown, they can't really supply and meet your demands. So well, they're how not are on you handling that? Right. Well, they're not on lockdown anymore. Uh, and so, uh, you know, China has returned to work um, for the most part. The factories are making these supplies. They're not on lockdown. So if they were to go on lockdown, of course, that would be a problem. Um, yeah, if if China I'm... were to go on lockdown, all of a sudden there wouldn't be any supply. And that is a risk. It's a risk that... It's uh, a huge risk because I think they went back out too soon and it may have, it's appearing like they may have to lock down again. Well, I, I hope that's not the case. Uh, if they do, um, it might be um, regional rather than national. So I think now that there's more knowledge about how to control outbreaks of, of coronavirus, uh, hopefully they can catch them early, do contact tracing and um, circle, you know, circle the outbreak basically um, it, regionally or locally rather than having to do a, a nationwide lockdown. And that I think is similar to the logic in the US of um, reopening in a kind of a rotating way. So some places reopen, other places are closed, and it sort of rotates. And some people go back to work, some don't. I think the idea uh, there is that that will reduce the potential spread or infection of the population. Now, that really needs to be modeled on a computer simulation, I think, to really understand if that'll work. It, it may well be that rotating in that way increases um, the spread uh, because people transmit it, then go home, stay home with their family, and everybody gets sick. Um, so it's not clear that just having some people rotate through will actually be better than you know, keeping everybody at home. Are you importing machinery as well, or only things like gloves and masks? Because clearly one of the problems we have in the US is a shortage of ventilators. What are you, what are you importing? Just so well, people can, who, who are watching this know what they could go to you for. So we actually are an FDA licensed medical device importer. Um, we can import ventilators. However, they're extremely hard to get. So um, we've had, and we have currently um, hundreds to thousands of ventilators that we have access to in China, but um, they're overpriced, far above market. Of um, course. Highly competitive to, to get them. So you can only get them if you have a, a buyer who's ready to literally, you know, send somebody to the factory and pay upon inspection. I and hate crisis equals inflation. Well, the thing is- <laughs> it's everyone's conscience. Well, I know it's not price gouging actually. It yeah. isn't. It's the law of supply and demand. I mean, it's not price gouging. It's in China, the, the, the demand for this finite supply of, of ventilators, you know, is, is humongous. It far outstrips the supply. And in a situation like that, uh, you know, it's the factory owners, um, you know, they either just sell everything they have at their old price and then they're out of business or they somehow, uh, you know, try to work with that demand and filter it by price, which would be, you know, actually the capitalist way of dealing with that problem. So we can't really fault them for being capitalists. Um, that's just how markets work. Um, so it's but compassion, even though it's business, everyone is being hit by this. I feel well, like we see, need to work thing. with each other. They aren't going to sell, you know, fewer or more ventilators if they lower the price. It, you know, from their perspective, they own factories, they made investments, and now the market wants their product. Um, and they can't, you know, they can't make more than they can make one way or the other. So, you know, if they, if they raise prices because demand has increased, I mean, that's just normal capitalism. 
Now where it gets a little more complicated is um, there are brokers and middlemen and, and you know, all kinds of parties now trying to sell their ventilators. There's an aftermarket or secondary market in their ventilators, which, uh, you know, the, in any commodity, essentially ventilators were never a commodity, but now they are. Um, whenever you have a commodity, you have traders, you have secondary kind of effects. Uh, and so that's what's happening. You have these things that were never commodities, now they've become commodities. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, prices being added uh, in the middle. And that's where the price has increased. So for example, with masks, um, there's been a lot of um, talk in the media about price gouging on masks. But what people don't understand is it starts at the factory. It's not that someone here got the mask for a dollar and then sold them for $7. That didn't happen. Anyone here who's selling a mask for $7 probably bought it for $6. And so they're just making a dollar. They're not making, you know, $6. So how did that $6 come to be? Well, you had a factory in China charging $2.95 or $3 for that mask. Then you have a broker, somebody representing them, adding some, something like a dollar, 50 cents to a dollar. Then you have whoever is taking the responsibility to ship it, to buy insurance and ship it um, to the US. Now, the price of freight has gone up dramatically um, from $3 to $13 in the last month per kilogram. Similarly, the raw material that masks are made of, which is called melt blown, um, is a scarce, difficult to make material that's increased 400% in price at least. So of course the factories, if their costs have gone up, their, their selling price is gonna go up. Um, and then because of all of the risks and geopolitical issues, the cost of freight has gone up also simply because there were, there were no real commercial flights traveling. Uh, most commercial travel is over. And that was, a, that was a large amount of the space that logistics companies were using for the shipment. So now they have to charter planes. And that costs $800,000 per 747, now even more, I hear. So when you add all these costs, what happens is you take a mask that costs three or $4 at its point of origin, and then you add another dollar or two for the brokers, insurance, and shipping to get it to the United States, and you're at, you know, you're already at a, a $6 mask, right? And then um, there's somebody, a distributor or somebody here um, helping the buyer or representing the seller. Either way, they have to make some money to facilitate that transaction too. Everybody has to get paid for their work. Um, and this is because right now, the traditional distribution chains, uh, the supply chains, the big distributors, don't have these. So instead, these ad hoc networks have formed. Um, and, and then looking at this problem, what we realized um, with VLX and the Valence Medical Exchange is if we can put a commodities exchange in place, um, it can cut out some of those costs and ultimately bring prices back to where they at least should be, um, and then ultimately back down to normal. Well, can you believe our time is almost gone? And I didn't even ask you how you and your family are coping with the coronavirus. And I haven't even asked you what you want to leave with my viewers. We're down to two minutes. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we've been self-isolating here at home um, for a couple months now. We started way before most people, um, based on all the research I had done. So uh, let's see, uh, it's been uh, almost uh, two and a half months now that we've been you know, really being careful, um, not going out, having things delivered, uh, and, and just staying away from public places. So that's actually, uh, sometimes it's challenging. Uh, I don't mind it too much because I'm working all the time anyway. I think my four-year-old is, is probably missing the playground and other kids. Um, so it's probably hard to be a kid in this situation. And what haven't you, what haven't I asked you that you want to leave with anyone watching this? Well, um, you know, I, th I think that this is going to be, you know, a trial. It's going to take a while. Um, I don't, I don't think there are going to be any immediate easy solutions. Um, you know, I wish, I wish that was going to happen right now. We're still in this surreal phase where we, re we remember what life was like before this. And the whole thing feels like a strange science fiction movie that we're all in. Um, it's kind of hard to believe that the world is so yeah. different, so different. So
I mean, only a few months ago, you could go to a restaurant, you know, you could get on a plane, uh, you could just, you could go into any store, uh, kids were in school, and now all of a sudden, you know, everything on television is about, you know, how far away to sit from other people and, and what to wear to protect yourself. Uh, and, you know, death rates and everybody's become an epidemiologist. It's a, <laughs> it's a very surreal shift. And uh, it, sorry. Yeah, and I, I think um, I think what we're in for are a few years of of, of trouble around this. Um, years. And, years. I years. Think yeah, I think it'll be two to three years before this is really solved. Um, I, I I think it'll be two to three years before this is really solved. I don't think we'll necessarily have to be at home for two to three years, but I do think that there will be risks and and behavior changes and significant changes in, in, in society at, for that period of time um, until we, we eradicate it one way or the other. Um, and so we need to be thinking about, you know, how to adapt and, and create the tools or, or use tools to work from home and, and actually to have kids get educated and have friends um, and how to keep the supply chain, whether it's food or prescription medicines or other medical supplies, how to keep that moving, which is a critical issue. Anova, thank you so much. Maybe this is just one of many interviews that we are going to do because if you have the time, because you have so much you can share with us that I think will help others. So I know it's Saturday night and you could have been out in the disco dancing amidst Corona 19, COVID-19, but instead you're here doing this with me. So for that, I am very grateful. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn, when a conversation is all you need to be inspired. Thank you, Nova. We'll be in touch.